afternoon. My name is Pete Saronis. I am excited today to have a wonderful fireside chat conversation with our guests here. Uh, we are super excited to talk a little bit about private LTE, a little bit about grid modernization, and get some insights and perspectives from subject matter experts. This type of industry insights roundtable is hopefully going to help uh, those of you listening learn a few new buzzwords like you need more in this day and age, uh, have a light bulb moment or two, but uh, with these incredible thought leaders that you're going to meet here in a minute, we really want to touch on how technology is something that in today's day and age is affecting humanity, how humanity is influencing culture of companies and then you know, industries as well as uh, you know families around the world, and then how that culture itself shapes the technology that we use. Uh, I'm a 25-year veteran from the federal government, former chief technology officer, super excited to connect some dots, build some bridges, and participate in this with my good friends from Anterex, a great company, a great culture. And we hope today that for over the next hour or so, these visionaries uh, uh, will shed some light for you on a topic that can be awfully complex and we hope to make it a bit more crystallized for you. Um, we're gonna talk about uh, private LTE. We're gonna talk about, uh, as I mentioned, grid modernization. We may even get to into explaining how all of this stuff works, whether it's energy or water or waste management in some of those sectors. You'll hear us use terms like critical infrastructure. And uh, the goal here is, again, to give you a, a picture of what the future is going to look like based on the research and development and efforts from the folks uh, and especially the companies that they work for today. So with that, uh, I'm going to introduce these amazing people. Uh, at least on my screen in the bottom left, we've got Amet Faruqi from the Brattle Group. And um, I'm going to read off some of my notes, even though I won't uh, be able to speak forever about how awesome these people are. Amet is an economist whose work is focused on enhancing energy efficiency through accelerating the adoption of digital technologies. It sounds like a lot, but it's pretty crystal clear to me. And modernizing tariffs. So there's an, an incredible ecosystem that's part technology and part regulatory as well. He provides expert advice and testimony on rate design, load flexibility, energy efficiency, all those wonderful things that keep our grid up and running. He's worked on grid modernization activities all over the world. I like to think of him as the globe trotter. He's got a master's of arts in agriculture economics, PhD in economics from UC Davis, a BA and an MA in economics from, geez, universities all around the world. And he's a speaker and, and, and just go read about him on LinkedIn. You're gonna be awfully impressed that he's got a pretty, pretty awesome pedigree. Um, Rick Schmidt. Rick Schmidt is the managing director for Black & Veatch Management Consulting. He, too, is a leader in this space around grid, critical infrastructure, advanced metering, operational, utility rates. Again, I'm not throwing these terms out to confuse anybody, but folks like Rick get it. Folks like on this group get it. And there's a lot to get, uh, especially where he is in his career. He leads grid modernization practice at Black & Veatch Management Consulting. He's involved with strategic tactical, tactical excuse me, and operational activities. Bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin and MBA from Cardinal Stritch University, if I said that right, Rick. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Andy Bourdine, a brother from another mother, 20 plus years uh, in this space, energy markets. He's the vice president for energy markets and innovation at Enterex, a great company that is really focused on spectrum being the underpinning for our nation's critical infrastructure. He was named a public utility fortnightly top 40 innovator. So kudos to you, Andy, not that you need more uh, trophies in your trophy box. He's held an appointment on the unmanned aerial systems task force for the governor in the state of Michigan. So we got a Midwesterner here who is uh, awesome. Uh, he served as a key lead witness in utility electric rate case activities and initiatives and has a bachelor of science degree and a master's degree. The BS is in electrical engineering from Kettering University, shout out to Kettering, and Baker College in computer information systems. So pedigreed guy himself. And uh, last but not least, Scott Shapel. I said that right, Scott. Um, sure. vice, <laughs> vice President of Global Enterprise Markets at Motorola Solutions. Everybody hears Motorola. It's probably like hearing Xerox or Kodak or any other company that you know is something we use or have used in our life, but they do a heck of a lot more than have 
flip phones, or if they even make those anymore. Uh, uh, Scott is uh, a designer. Um, he's a marketer. He uh, helps implement private LTE, and we're going to get into that. You know, that distinguishes LTE from private LTE. He's an author himself. Um, prior to this role, he's had numerous jobs around the country and North America promoting telecommunications as that infrastructure ping power pipe that makes everything work, as I like to say. And he is a graduate from Marquette University with a BS degree, again, in electrical engineering. Um, my niece goes to Marquette, so I'm kind of a fan. Even though I'm a Villanova boy, you're a big East kind of guy, so I dig that. Um, Listen, that's who we have today, folks, and we're going to jump right in because this is a true fireside chat. I've got my water. I've got a little coffee. Uh, if you have to sneeze or raise a hand, that's how we're going to treat this. We are four or five guys here having a virtual virtual discussion. So with that, fellas, you ready? Awesome. Yep. Okay. Quiet smiles. That's all good. Rick, um, I'm going to kick it off with you because you and your bio and pedigree talk a lot about your experience with private LTE, advanced metering infrastructure. Um, can you kind of just speak to the Joe Sixpack and all of us about what is AMI and why should we care? Just to give a little a taste. Sure. Just a little background on, on AMI, advanced metering infrastructure. Over, over the last 20 years, there's been an evolution of, of wireless metering uh, between uh, the office and the the premises and now we're in an environment where uh, a lot of the uh, technology was deployed like second generation around 2010 2009 with some of the smart grid investment grant money a lot of the uh, utilities have selected a mesh based which is 900 megahertz ism band uh, the other technology that is very common is is a, a point to multi point narrow band license. You know, Census, Tantalus, Declara have a have a licensed technology. And initially, it was really all about remote meter reading, reading the meters meter to cache uh, with a wireless technology. That technology and those use cases have advanced to to serve needs for distribution automation. Uh, talking to inverters, uh, street lights, other uh, telemetry applications, and, uh, and and now we're kind of at a crossroads. You know, where a lot of the technologies are, are pretty, they're getting into their life cycle, eight, nine, 10, 11 years, and some of the questions are, where where do you go from here, and what what is the next generation, and uh, and what what might I do differently the next time around? So, yeah, and and I appreciate that, and again. Uh, of course, I was excited to get you going into kind of a deep dive there. And again, for the audience, you know, I want, I hope people think about the power grid, the thing that turns the lights on in our room and heats our homes. It's a complex network of networks. And, you know, I'm going to pivot here to Andy to kind of maybe set a stage too for some of that complexity. And, and the energy sector aside, uh, we're hearing terms today like smart infrastructure, smart meters, you know, the utilities slow to adopt, but yet they're the ones that really need to create a smart grid, or at least as owners and operators. Can you give us a perspective on the utility industry, you know, from where you've been and what you see today, Andy, about this next generation smart grid? Sure. Thanks, Pete. Um, you know, I, and I've shared this before, but if you looked at um, myself in particular, deploying infrastructure even 10 years ago, uh, a lot of the communications portions of that were an afterthought. You had many different networks kind of each selected for a specific use case um, and, you know, all the bells and whistles that went along with that. But typically the communications portion would just be based on our engineering diagrams, a black box on the corner that someone else kind of dealt with. Fast forward to today and the, just the number, the sheer number of endpoints uh, that are going out there for utility use really demand that there's a network infrastructure in place that's really pulling all of that together. Um, and so we see uh, companies, specific utilities, uh, even though sometimes slow moving, starting to gravitate towards that uh, kind of methodology in terms of how they're setting up their systems. Um, and there's a lot to be done there, uh, but it's, it's, it's new, it's kind of happening right now. And it's some of the questions that we're seeking to answer and get our heads around is those large amounts of data um, are coming back. 
Yeah, and, and Andy, I know you'll get to this a little later because, you know, again, the goals here to talk a little bit about the complexity. And again, when I say buzzword bingo at times, whenever I do a talk here and there, it's we want to introduce some of the terms, but I call it ping power pipe, folks. The stuff you can't see, the stuff behind the walls, it has to work, it has to be architected. And then if it's your phone, if it's your thermostat, as I look at my smart meter and I voice activate it now, that all is uh, a wonderful capability but we have to architect properly. And that's where, Scott, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pivot over to you and maybe you can talk a little bit about, in your case, you've seen telecommunications evolve, right? We, uh, I remember the days of soft switches and voice over IP being like, you know, somebody called it Satan once. I'm like, well, it really isn't. It's something that we're gonna maybe all wanna use today when we converge. But, but today with the power grid and utilities, you know, uh, architecting spectrum, uh, leveraging standards-based equipment to communicate so that it works. Uh, there's a science behind that. So can you speak a little bit to some of that ping power pipe world and what, what you as an engineer are excited about, but also, you know, not to say slow to adopt, but want folks to understand it's not something you go buy down the street at Best Buy and plug into your home. Yeah, and I, I think at, uh, you know, at Motorola, we've, what we're probably known for is, uh, you know, redundant, reliable, resilient, secure, wireless. Uh, done that for years on the narrow band side. So a lot of that translates to the broadband uh, capability. And then to some extent, even more important when you're thinking about security and prioritization and some of those things. Um, but from a design uh, uh, perspective, the same things apply, you know, coverage, uh, reliability of communication, um, uh, all those things that we've we've done historically on the narrow band side, I think, are, are just as important as I said, or more so in the in the broadband piece, um, and especially around security and prioritization. Yeah, and we're going to come back uh, to some of that cyber physical security that is uh, synonymous with any IT OT convergence. Again, folks, OT operational technology, IT information technology. I like to say the internet meets uh, industrial control systems, which again, ICS, there's SCADA, there's program logic controller configuration, there's distribution control systems, pretty complex stuff. But people like to throw around ICS these days and cyber physical, but a guy like Scott can break that down and say exactly how we're gonna secure it. All right, Amet, absolutely last but not least. Uh, what, a, what a great guy to have talk about the impact to the consumer, to the economy. Uh, you've heard a bit of us kind of geek out a bit here uh, in terms of the grid components, but tariffs are a part of that economies, uh, you know, revenue is, is part of this. Can you kind of just give a perspective what, what you think as we're talking about the impact on the consumer and then the economy in general? So the big question is, what's in it for the consumer? So we have the smart grid, we have AMI, we have all of these complex uh, terminologies that we just heard from the other panelists. The consumer doesn't honestly need to know what all of that is about. The consumer doesn't even understand those terms, right? But what they do understand is they want to have a good life. They want to have a low bill. They want to have control over how they live their life in their house or in their business. So if they have a smart meter, and by the way, by the end of December, we will have 100 million smart meters in the US. We have about 135 million residential customers. So about 80% will be on smart meters. How many of them have smart tariffs? Only 4%. And so you have quite a disconnect between the ability of the customer to use that power efficiently so that the grid is not overloaded or underloaded, so that the grid has optimal usage, but there is no signal coming to the consumer despite there being a smart meter, despite there being AMI, most consumers don't have that opportunity. So they're just using it whenever they want to use it. And that's creating a, a quite an expenditure problem for the utilities who have to overinvest in peaking capacity. That's point number one. Point number two, as we look at the future, every state of the union wants to go green, wants to have more renewable energy. Actually, the expression I use is the states are going green with envy. Every yeah, that's day, a good so one. Tweet that one, anybody. Tweet that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what you have is it's all supply side solutions at this moment. You have solar and wind on the grid, but what if the sun doesn't shine? There's mm -hmm. cloud cover, 
what if the wind stops blowing? That's exactly what happened in California on August 14th and 15th. There was a blackout. Now, how primitive is a blackout for the world's digital capital, which is what California claims to be? It has Silicon Valley, it has all the high-tech companies. As a last resort, what do they do when supply suddenly diminishes? They just cut off customers on a random basis. So we have a ways to go before we interact like we should, like we're living in the 21st century, we shouldn't be back to the 19th century where you just cut off power when the sun stops shining. So I, I, we can come back to that, but that to me is the big challenge. The consumer is going to get ahead of us very soon. They will put solar on the roof. They'll buy generators, right? Nobody wants to be without power in the middle of a heat wave, let alone when there's a pandemic sure. and you're not outside. So, so that's the challenge for utilities. Yeah, and I see some heads nodding. We're going to jump into private LTE here for a minute, but I think what I took away from that summary there was, you know, the consumer, the prosumer is part of the grid infrastructure, right? I mean, you're talking about I mean, people, I'm looking at my house here, there are people with solar panels, right? There are folks probably with a wind farm in their backyard, but the idea, and I know this from my world inside the Beltway, the idea, and we all know about distributed energy, Mm -hmm. It's needed. It's not about fossil or renewable, right? It's or nuclear. It's about how does it all create the demand response we need and create at the end of the day a resilient cyber physical secure grid. So keep exactly. that in mind as we kind of build that into because folks who's what who are watching, there's plenty of devices, every TV in your home, you can voice activate. It's a smart this, that, or the other, but there's a lot of engineering behind that has to work. Okay, I'm going to pivot over to Rick here now. Rick, I'm going to kind of read a definition of private LTE that I at least speaks to me and the Joe six pack inside of me. And then maybe you can wax a little bit on your views because let's introduce this concept of private LTE uh, as an option for this secure resilient grid. A private LTE network leverages localized micro towers and small cells conceptually like Wi-Fi access points to provide coverage and connectivity and it functions much like a scaled down version of a public cellular network. Does that resonate with you or am I missing something there and what, what to you is a benefit of private LTE? Well, when I look at private LTE, I mean, it, it isn't that magically different than a lot of other point to multi-point technologies from an architecture standpoint. You have base stations where you'd have a, a some form of a tower or a pole. You're going to communicate to, to downline devices and you have a you would do a design, you know, similar to as the utilities have been doing for, for many years. But technically what what's different, you have an open protocol in LTE where there's there's literally dozens of manufacturers making end devices that will be interoperable with the with the master system. Two, it's TCP IP. Three, a utility can throttle where they need more bandwidth, where, where they can get by with less bandwidth, and where they need coverage. So you have the flexibility to design it where you need it, where you want it, and customize it for your own, your own needs. So the flexibility of it and, and and probably what I what I what I'm starting to see, and if you really model a lot of different technologies, is a, we're expecting a longer life cycle with with private LTE and even the ability to get to 5G private LTE. Longer life cycles. When you do the math and you and you look at how to what kind of leverage a technology from a business case standpoint, how do I get 13, 14, 15, 16 years? out of a technology. And that's really where the differences start to play. You have more control over that life cycle. Okay, no, no, great point. And there's a couple things I'm sort of gonna try to set the stage for my my ex or our experts here are considerations. Andy, I want you to be thinking about, you know, the role that spectrum plays and then how do you pick the right spectrum maybe and that sort of thing and the role from a utility standpoint. I'm gonna go to, to Scott here for a minute. You know, coverage, reliability, uptime, security. OK, um, I have a, a question here I put down with, you know, Scott, in a recent article, you mentioned the ability for utilities to prioritize traffic types on private LTE. That seems logical and crystal to me as, pop, you know, just like if I'm in a data center controlling traffic into and out of my data center or cloud. Can you speak to, though, the significance of having that type of uh, ability to control traffic from a utility perspective? 
Yeah, and I, I, I think Rick just mentioned, you know, customizable and controllable is part of uh, the private system deployment. I think same with prioritization. Um, I think two things. One, the ability to um, create network access priority. So the mix of endpoints and vendors that he talks about. Um, how do I prioritize those for access to the network, especially during uh, times of constraint? Mm -hmm. um, and then once on the network, how do I prioritize the applications to make sure the latency and, and throughput and quality of service uh, that I need for certain applications at certain times based on the incident uh, are available to me? So you can prioritize by application as well as by user. So, right, maybe, maybe you know, Rick's my supervisor and he's going to have more access to the same application than I will at a certain time. Um, want to prioritize uh, the grid automation applications, maybe over workflow applications at certain points in time with a, with a storm or an outage. So the ability to control access to the network and prioritization and access within the network, uh, I think are all, are all elements to uh, what Rick referred to as, as uh, control and customi customization. And by the way, that's dynamic as well. So I can change that as I go as a private system owner. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at some heads nodding before I jump over to Andy. You know, Emmett, do you have a comment on that? I, I wasn't sure if you wanted to jump in or you want to let Andy speak to that. Uh, no, I, I think Andy should speak. Okay, Roger that. So, Andy, um, I'm just judging the 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 nonverbal communication here. But when I see people antsy, I'm like, jump in. Um, so, Andy, uh, private LTE, uh, you can control it. There's uh, always the option to use a public you know, carrier is your primary. I, I hear a lot about folks saying, I want a private LTD as my back, you know, back drop to a to a, a primary network or secondary. Um, can you speak a little bit though to this, the spectrum component so that we can geek out a little bit? This is the stuff folks, without it, we do not communicate. And there are terms like licensed, shared, unlicensed, and bandwidth allocation. Why don't you give everybody a Professor Andy, you know, for dummies, if you will, not that anyone out there is dumb. Sure, you know, and Pete, you had mentioned uh, the term earlier, critical infrastructure, which is is such an important one, um, especially for utilities. And when they're looking at their communications needs, um, you really need uh, a system that's utility grade. And, and much of what we're talking about, at least in terms of uh, private spectrum, uh, gives them that ability to have control over the system. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at spectrum in general, uh, without getting too much into the physics of things, um, there's multiple different bands. Uh, it's usually split up kind of into three areas, a low band, a mid band, and a high band. Um, and when you look at what's optimal, at least for utility use, uh, most are focusing on the low band or sub one gigahertz range. And there's some qualities uh, with that range that give them a number of um, uh, abilities. One of those is that the propagation characteristics or the ability for that signal to travel farther uh, is more prominent or in the uh, low band areas. Um, so what that means in terms of utilities when they're looking at the infrastructure that it takes for a telecom type build out, it means that there's less infrastructure that's needed because your signal's traveling farther. Um, the penetration rate through, you know, brick and mortar type buildings is also greater in that category. So, you know, a lot are, a lot are focusing um, in kind of the one gigahertz or less uh, range, uh, and it is giving them uh, benefits in several areas. So depending upon, obviously, the type of spectrum you want to choose from, I kind of think of it like when I pick a cable plan, right? I could pay more money for maybe more services, but those services might not be what I need. I have a small footprint in my home. I only need so much Wi-Fi and access points and my neighbors might. So I, I, I think and I know what you're implying, but uh, folks, take a look at the radio magnetic spectrum on Google or whatever you use as your search engine. It's a one pager. It's awfully complex, but you got a lot of choices out there. Just know what you're looking to apply um, or will use that spectrum for. So Andy, that was awesome. Uh, Emmett, um, I you wrote an article recently that says uh, something to the effect that private LTE broadband will support expanded non-wire alternatives. What is a non-wire alternative and how does that consumer benefit from it? So the non-wire alternative is something 
that uh, the customer is able to do in their house. They can reduce their consumption. They can shift it from peak to off peak. They can put, uh, as you mentioned, they can become a prosumer and have solar on the roof. They can also put a battery there and pair that with the solar panel. They can buy an electric car. All of those technologies are examples of customer located technologies that don't require the electric company to do anything special. That's what the wires would be, even the utilities providing service through the transmission lines and the distribution circuits, those are the wires. What the customer is doing at their premise is non-wires. It's not the best terminology, I didn't create it. It doesn't seem to convey anything, but basically it's decentralized solutions. It is part of the American ethos, you could say, the desire for people to be self-sufficient, to be organic. All of that is NWA. So what you have is though, as, as we're looking at the reality today, as I mentioned, there are 100 million smart meters out there, but you go and take a look at one of those meters and you will be looking at ancient technology. You look at what the customer has in their house, the smartphone that you mentioned, the voice activated technology. So the prosumers have a solar inverter and the solar inverter has a meter, it's digital. You can ping it and it shows you on your phone what the reading is. Try doing that with your smart meter. Okay. Also, the smart meter has a display that doesn't light up at night. Even if you look at it, you can't see anything. The solar inverter display is modern, right? So, so you have this disconnect now between what utility meters look like versus what the consumer's own non-wires meters look like. Consumers have, if they have an electric car, they have a smart charger in their garage, right? And that's from Siemens or some other high-tech company. It has all kinds of features. So interestingly, NWA solutions, the non-wires, de decentralized solutions are contemporary and modern and digital, have all the features you want, compare that to what you're getting from the utility, and it's almost like stone age. So there's a frustration, a disconnect, and it's a huge investment challenge because it already costs a lot of money to put that AMI in, the 100 million meters, but they're already obsolete. They're already looking pretty ancient compared to these new high-tech devices. So that's the challenge. Yeah, so let me let me jump over here to Rick. Rick, the utility, you know, what can you share? Um, how and uh, maybe you have an example of what excites a utility be about this smart infrastructure, AMI. You know, they're not just secure their network and bring the customer better enhanced service, but also drive revenue. Is and maybe is it? Are you seeing it more of a late adoption in the utility industry? No, it it really has been an evolution. I mean, when, when it comes to advanced metering and then you look at other automation activity, it started, of course, 20 years ago with just substation SCADA, very basic level, obviously very critical for the infrastructure. Then we started to see more downline into the feeders and eventually we had a, a metering angle and then we also had an automation in the feeder you know, activity going on. And, and what we really are seeing is with the grid modernization plans that are, are in the roadmaps, it's just more and more applications that require communications. Mm -hmm. And some of, those, some of those applications need to be powered by batteries because they're not directly on the grid. Some are mission critical, some are not. So you just, you're seeing just a growth of needs for communications. The volume's going up, sometimes the bandwidth needs are going up, the coverage needs are getting very, very unique. So uh, really out there, there's not a one size fits all. And right now we have just so many different technologies being used. How can some of these multiple technologies be consolidated into at least fewer, <laughs> fewer different, you know, communication technologies in the future? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm writing down my stream of consciousness thought, you know, Scott, I'm gonna come up to you here in a second. Um, in a world that's evolving, I've heard that word two or three times, I think, um, there's billions of devices to Amet's point. Uh, I, I'm the super cluster chairperson for energy water waste management. I have an international community that I get to speak with around the world uh, and learn of, of some of the innovation, the creative inventiveness, as I like to call it, that's occurring. But it's great when you say, ooh, there's another app that can do this or a device that can do that. And then you have to worry about standards and tariffs and regulation. And I get it. But we're moving at such a clip. So, um, you know, Scott, from an engineering standpoint, I guess the same question I'm going to pivot to you is, you know, road mapping, 
you know, your your title, uh, forgive me in advance, but uh, let me go back to it being someone that I would want to come and help me think what I need to do in one, three, and five years. Okay, I call that real road mapping that's dynamic to Rick's point. Um, how are you seeing the dialogue change in the company, specifically utilities, looking at this OTIT convergence? And yes, I know security matters, but you know, building security into a converged network takes a lot of re-engineering and trust that, that you can buy devices that will protect those high value assets, i.e. the data that the consumer you know, creates. Well, so on the security front, I think there are a couple questions in there potentially, but um, I'll deal with security first, then maybe the, uh, the future leaning vision piece of it. Um, so on the security piece, Security can be a whole topic of its own that could take us through a whole webinar, right? Um, in general, a couple thoughts uh, as it relates to the private networking, though. Uh, in general, first thing we do, wh whether it's building products, uh, implementing networks, um, creating services, is follow the NIST model, right? So that's from, uh, like I said, product development, uh, network protection, which we'll talk about here, um, through uh, detect and respond kind of things. That's the cybersecurity framework you're referring to, correct? Yes. Yeah. Right. And this, yeah. folks, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, a component of the new United States Department of Commerce. Yeah, so we follow that. Uh, it's a recommendation, recommendation we make uh, when implementing networks with our, our customers. Um, I think a couple thoughts on the network security side of that. First of all, private systems oftentimes will leverage um, private backhaul, private connectivity. Um, to, to bring them together, right, between the, the sites, their e-nodes in this case, and the core. Um, and that allows the customer to, to deploy their own firewalls and switches, set up their own policies that are in conjunction with their corporate security policies, right? Um, so that be that would be one thing. Uh, LTE technology itself brings some great um, security features with it, security around the signaling and control aspects of it. Um, in addition, uh, the encryption of the, the application or payload, right? So it has AES encryption available to it. On a private system, incrementally, a customer can add um, key infrastructure, right? Or uh, PKI, I think they call it. Um, but key infrastructure that allows you to manage certificates and encryption keys and change them as your needs change and develop and grow. So that's one of the advantages there. Um, I guess the last piece on the application side maybe would be whitelisting, right? When you think about how do I how do I keep from some ransomware attacks or things like that. So limiting the number of applications and uh, that can run on the network to what you want to run on the network. Um, I think that's all some of the security advantages of having a private system uh, available to you. Yeah, no, great points. And again, I want to shout out to you and and to those who are listening. You know, the cybersecurity framework, I believe it's version 1.1, is available for use. It's a collaborative effort that NIST with industry, critical infrastructure uh, folks particularly said, hey, here's a taxonomy. Here's a best practice to think about some of the terms that Scott mentioned, detecting, responding. And it's really there as a guideline, a framework, a methodology for you to say, how much risk am I willing to take on and at least use some best practices to get there? It's, again, not just about buying a piece of hardware or software. It's having a plan. So, Scott, thank you for bringing that up. Andy, um, can you give us an example, given that we're in this whole private LTE and control? And the question is, you know, wh where would be a situation we're having especially right now where we're seeing things in the Gulf Coast and in California, you know, natural disasters, to have um, maybe a, a private LTE as your, your, your backbone, as your, you know, network for, for a utility. Sure. You know, there's so many different areas and security was a great one uh, to kind of start out with. Uh, but when you, when you look at it, it can be, and, and one of the things that's kind of jump-starting this topic is you start to look at all of the natural disaster-related things that are happening uh, around the globe, but even in the U.S. right now, from wildfires to hurricane season getting underway to some of the more traditional storms, um, you know, in the western areas. Um, you start to see a need for a system that is highly reliable, that utilities can count on real-time. Um, and the way I kind of describe it is you need, you know, eyes on your system. You need to know what's happening when so that you can address it. 
Um, and whether that's uh, you know shipping crews and crew movements to the needed areas, uh, to knowing where um, outages are happening real time, you know these are all all important parts of that equation. Uh, the reason a uh, utility or other entity would want a private system for that is because it ultimately gives them control over the uptime uh, that that system is available. So you know as well as I do, um, when hurricanes roll through, it's not just the utility that's affected, it's a lot of different industries, communications paths are knocked down. And so rather than you know a utility waiting for uh, someone else to repair that and let them know when they can see their own system again, they have the ability to prioritize those repairs uh, and make you know uh, any needed changes in order to help with that effort. That translates into um, you know a lot less or reduction in outage time for customers and ultimately savings for businesses that are you know desperately trying to get back online after those type of events. Yeah, you know, Rick, your point about again, I hope folks watching this are, are hearing that that critical infrastructure and the 16 sectors in our country deemed most critical: uh, energy, again, transportation, dams, water, health, defense, industrial base, to name a few, agriculture, food, uh, teamed with you know having connectivity to Emmett's point about there's billions of devices that can, can give us that situational awareness. And again, and this is to me with maybe. The glass half full what an opportunity to have the information at the ready to make decisions or have the decisions made for us so that loss of life is not enhanced right you know knowing something's about to happen or while it's happening and allowing automation to kick in is where i think we can see the opportunity of technology you know creating resilience um you know but Amit, I, I wanted to ask you because I know this is your sweet spot, but I think a lot of the, the audience, when it comes to regulatory and tariffs, you have, um, we chatted on our prep call about, uh, is it in the best interest of the consumer to pay for one utility operational network that supports not just energy, but say gas, water, uh, electric, the whole kit and caboodle, and why, and, and why hasn't it happened, or do you see it making progress? Um, it's uh, kind of uh, fallen through the cracks. That's why it's not happened. Mm. Uh, there are different uh, parties owning uh, their customers, but ultimately it is the same customer who buys mm. electricity and natural gas and water and, and you know waste management services. So I've always wondered why cannot you have, as a just as a public citizen, I've had that question, and uh, as an economist. Uh, it's clear to me that everyone's trying to sub-optimize. They're not willing to give up control. They're not willing to share. Now, there mm. are examples where sharing is occurring, uh, like between uh, some utilities, but it, it's a bit of an uphill struggle. And uh, I think it's caught up in how American businesses operate. There is, uh, everyone's doing their own thing. This is a societal challenge. You can reduce the overall cost to that one customer at the end. If instead of having three networks or five networks, you just have one network. But how do you create that sharing philosophy? I think it's partly an institutional challenge. And the economic opportunity is there, but the institutional barriers are, are pretty real. So it, it hasn't quite uh, come to pass. I mean, people are working on it, and I, perhaps it will come to pass. In, now, there are some municipal utilities, as you know, that do actually own multiple, that provide multiple services. Uh, all of the ones you mentioned. And in their cases, it would be a natural occurrence. But for the investor-owned sector, that tends to not be the case. So let me let me uh, take that question, you know, again, to the group that I think as human beings, we all know that there are cylinders of excellence. We call that in government, the silos for a purpose. And the, the grid physically, uh, I like to say, has been air gap for years because it needs to be up, right? Uh, at least in my lifetime, never ever woken up and said the entire grid's down, but there have been times in 2003 and others where chunks of the country's been down. But uh, as we see this convergence happening, um, you know, you hit on a point there, I met that, that I think that utilities still uh, can have a tendency to say, hey, I have my customers, I'm going to make sure they have power. Best practices, Rick, um, is that something that you feel is starting to occur more often where people are willing to share uh, information, whether that's you know data with 
with the government or with others to say, here's how we're protecting data, creating resilience, uh, or is it just, you know, not a, we aren't there yet. We still are in this silo mentality. You know, when, when looking at trying to share investments for let's say an electric utility with maybe in their territory will be some municipal utilities, some cooperative utilities, some water utilities. We are seeing pockets of success where the regulatory bodies in certain states are improving dark fiber leases. So you mm. can take your, your excess capacity, lease it to the water utility, lease it to others. Uh, that model, I think also makes a lot of sense for private LTE where you build the canopy over the territory and you have other mission critical utilities that could benefit by those assets. Yes. And that that revenue stream can offset some of those investments that goes to the rate payer. So there's, there are opportunities for, for new revenue, um, uh, but it's a state by state regulatory uh, a challenge. And I think as we're doing business cases and as we're explaining to the regulators how the rate payer can benefit by that, and you show them the math and show them the economies of scale, I think we're gonna see more of it, but we have started with kind of the dark fiber leases, and that's been kind of evolving over the last few years, I, much, much more so in the cooperative and municipal market, and we're starting to see pockets, pockets of success here and there on, on the IOUs, IOU side. Yeah, no, I love that. I mean, again, I'm already thinking that facts tell, stories sell is something I like to, to constantly remind, and that is uh, myself even. And, you know, there's plenty of money to be made, right? It's not always a transaction. How can we make money and pass it off to, look, I, I used to look at my bill and be like, I don't know what the hell any of this means. I just am paying it. Now I look at the bill, and at least in my distribution space, I can say, ooh, look how I'm spending it. You know, the idea of having information that makes sense to me, the consumer, heck, I'm even willing to pay a little bit more if I have an option for a generated uh, uh, wind energy to power my home. It just might be something I like to do. Choice there, right, Emmett? So, Scott, let me ask you a quick question. Um, what's your thought on that? Uh, are you seeing the culture shift where it's not about let's just meet the mail and, and comply with NERC and FERC? But, you know, hey, if we got to invest a penny, that's going right to the consumer. I mean, at some point, it's it's to your point, Rick, I think, be a storyteller. Explain to our customers, here's the value of having an integrated grid, even if you have to pay a bit more because it's going to create resilience when that next uh, snowmageddon happens. You're on mute, buddy. Okay. Oh, I, my dog was... It's all good, me. man. Keeping uh, it real, okay? It's a virtual <laughs> world. Let the dog bark. So I would agree with um, uh, with Rick. I think we're seeing pockets of of uh, success with sharing like that. And actually, I've, I've seen it here recently with um, uh, government and utilities sharing, like state government and utilities mm -hmm. working together on some shared networks and infrastructure. So I do think we are seeing... Um, more of that. I think at the end of the day, right, ratepayer, taxpayer, same person. Why are we building multiple networks? Uh, so I think that story makes sense to people um, and to the regulators. So I think while we see it in the utility space sharing among themselves, we also see some pockets of, of sharing outside the, the, the enterprise. Yeah, Andy, I, I know that that your background, I mean, knowing you and, and big fan, uh, you come from that energy utility world. You, you're now working with some folks who are uh, legendary, iconic figures in the telecommunication world. And you're seeing here's two utilities, telco and energy. And what's your reaction and what are you seeing? Because I think you're right there. You know, you, you've lived it and now you're seeing, I don't know, maybe the benefit of, hey, folks, you know, can't we all just get along is what comes yeah. to mind and share. What is your perspective? From a utility perspective, um, I, I think they're definitely starting to see uh, the importance of you know telecommunications and what they're doing. Uh, but to, to kind of bring it back to uh, the regulatory conversation a little bit, um, you know, state commissions, um, especially those kind of presiding and regulating uh, some of the larger investor owned utilities, they have a tough job uh, ahead of them. You know, they have to not only you know you've got the end consumer in mind who uh, they're desperately trying to make sure are getting high value for the money they're spending uh, every month on their utility bills um, but you're also looking for those ways for 
uh, whether it's utilities to work together, uh, that cross collaboration you're kind of talking about with uh, different sectors of energy, um, and even some utilities that might have you know gas and electric under their own umbrella, sometimes they struggle to you know mirror those in terms of some of these technologies. So that, for me, you know, the conversation kind of comes from two different directions. I think part of it needs to be regulators looking, saying, hey, you know, what makes sense for our state or our region? Uh, and how can we partner with utilities to make that happen? Uh, but I think the utilities also need to tee up some of that information in terms of the bigger picture, which you know isn't something that's typically done. Amit, you have a, a, a thought on that? Just the sh information sharing, cross collaboration. What are you seeing maybe in your globe trotting that's working in other countries? Um, it's not working anywhere, honestly. That that's what I'm seeing for all the reasons that. Well, that's we have, a glass half full uh, perspective. I love that. Keep it real. The huge opportunity. Uh, it's sort of like the salesman who went to some African country and said only two percent of the people wear shoes. There is no opportunity. And the other one who came, he said ninety eight percent are the opportunity. So, mm. so it, it, it's a, it's an opportunity uh, waiting to be harnessed. And I continue to think, why has it been so difficult to harness it? Even for the combination utilities, as Andy just mentioned, I have worked with many electric and gas utilities. Those are two separate divisions. I worked for one utility where they had steam as the third business unit. And I was mm. doing a project for the steam business unit. This was sort of in, uh, I won't name the company, but I think you can probably figure out which one it was. Uh, they uh they would regard their gas business unit as a competitor and the gas business unit would regard the electric business unit as a competitor even though there's one corporation and now you go beyond that to multiple corporations like a phone company and an electric company and it's sort of they are a daggers drawn or so it seems uh, and i wondered is there a better way to do this and some people have put forward radical ideas of government ownership Okay. So the government comes in and the government owns the infrastructure, but it's not going to work in the U.S. I mean, for all the reasons we know, but there are other countries where it is done. And so obviously government ownership brings with it a lot of negatives in terms of bureaucracy and no incentives, et cetera. But it's a question of it's a public good. This infrastructure yes. is a public good. It falls through the cracks and and therefore i mean if it was if it was left to the private sector to build bridges across the bay here in san francisco they would never get built the government built it now everyone benefits from the bridge being there but if you had asked a private company to do it they would say i have no idea how many people will cross the bridge how will i collect the money so i think we have to look into some of these more out of the box solutions to see why is not working now there are people but one last thing i'll say sure sure who have said let's merge these companies let's mm. have bigger corporations so the phone company is also now the electric company and i think that idea is dead on arrival because that would be a huge monopoly kind of an image and if there's anything that's really prevalent these days in market economies is is let's get rid of the monopolies let's have competition sure. so that solution doesn't quite pan out, even though it, it, it under enlightened leadership, it could work out, but the trust is not there in even bigger monopolies. All right. So, so that was so like real. And I think most people can say yes. And all right, well, we have to, if that's the, where we are today, I think since we titled this, this talk, um, visioneering the future grid or visioneering, uh, what the future will look like, uh, visioning the, I'm sorry, visioneering the private networked grid of the future. Now, this isn't the parting shot, which is when you all get 45 seconds. But, Rick, I'm going to ask everybody, and this is totally coming out of left field. What technology, and I'll say, for example, AI, machine learning, cyber, sensors, are you most excited about? And whether you're in a government person watching this, Joe or Joanne Sixpack, an investor, you're a thought leader, man. You're a visionary. What are you seeing and what technology that excites you about the utility industry? I, I, I don't look at it that way. Honestly, uh, I, I look back, what, what problems are we trying to solve mm. with technology? And, and if you look at your strategic plan for a utility, where are you at 
with your reliability? Where are you at with your resiliency? And, and what problems are we trying to solve? And then you start looking at technology. And, and kind of the, the technology is, is, I think, secondary. And, and you, you, you're seeing, obviously, breakthroughs in so many, so many areas. And what the, what the utilities are able to take advantage of is just the general breakthroughs of, of, of technology in general, from, from the communications infrastructure to the to the to the new software uh, and and analytics, the analytics is greatly improving. The integration of multiple systems are getting easier, better. So it it's really a combination of of baby steps that have been taking on over many years to the point of where we at now versus a so-called just silver bullet of, sure. a, of a technology that's out there. It's a combination of it all. Together. I love it. I, I love the what problem are you trying to solve? Because technology won't be the problem. There's something out there for it. Okay, let's switch it up here. Uh, Andy, what what do you what kind of are you reading about and excited about? You know, when I uh, the thing I'm most excited about with the future is really kind of for the utility to be able to see the future real time. And uh, Rick hit on that a little bit. For me, it's a lot around predictive analytics um, and the you know, the sensors that are being deployed, the amount of data that's now uh, starting to come back uh, to these utilities. Um, and, the, you know, the example that I'll use is infrastructure in general. Uh, you can say poles and wires, you can say roads, anywhere around the country, uh, you'll find that it's crumbling and in need of repair. And most of these systems, the utilities do not have the funds needed to just go out and blanket repair everything. So their ability to determine where problems are, but more importantly, where problems are going to happen in the future has a huge impact uh, on their investment strategy. Um, if you're able to predict that, repair things that need to be repaired before they fail, um, you know, you're saving a lot of money, uh, both in crew time, um, you know, and, and dispatch resources. So that prediction, um, or in my mind, kind of seeing the future real time, that's what's most interesting to me. Yeah, I love it. You brought in the sensors, which uh, we know are technologies that can provide data. And I love the idea of, you know, situationally saying, don't blanket and put one on every pole. Maybe you kind of find out where are these fires, these earthquakes, these storms happening. And let's learn from that. I always say when Superstorm Sandy occurred, people said, oh, now we know that when it hits again, we're ready. We captured so much data. And I remember someone in the halls of the DOE saying, that's assuming it hits at the right time, same time of day, same force, and you know, prescriptive analytics. I think to build off of your response, Andy, are are so so um, spot on. Okay, um, Scott, visioneer that you are. Um, so I I think picking up on a couple of the comments already made, I, I I'm excited just about the integration of technologies and capabilities that are there today. To solve problems or solve them in a different way. So, you know, analytics. There's quite a bit of, of things available today around analytics, right? Um, we talk about the network capabilities. So, I mean, we're looking at things like how can I use my voice with a land mobile radio or a smart device uh, to communicate to a, a grid asset, right? Ask for simple information, get sensor readings. To, to Andrew's point. Um, you know, just like you do at home today with uh, with Alexa, um, you know, or things like that. So I think there's a lot of capabilities there. I'm excited about the integration of those capabilities to bring um, uh, new ability to solve problems, either existing problems in a different way or or new things as they develop. So I think it's less about a silver bullet or some new magic answer than integrating what we have. I love it. Love the word integration, always have. And I do love the fact that Alexa and Google and whatever else is out there, Rings and Series will be on our polls. Uh, but think about this for a minute. We said it at the beginning, humanity, technology, and culture. There could be a right fit. It doesn't have to be the exact one for some company but or industry. Uh, but that's a pretty cool thing to think about how the human, it's not about replacing jobs. Somebody still would want to talk into it. Um, I took that away, so I appreciate that perspective. Okay, Amet, what what is your visioneering of the moment? So, so uh, the three ideas. The first one, which others have mentioned already, is basic maintenance. A lot of these wildfires, as you know, are being caused by uh, the, the power lines touching 
um, vegetation. And, and all over the state, I see that, that you have poles that are leaning into the street, they're tilted, they're made of wood, you have wires running through vegetation. And why? Because there's no money, apparently, to do the normal maintenance. It's been 20 years and nobody has focused on them. Mm. Second, I have run into utility people who tell me they don't have a budget to maintain the fleet vehicles. They cannot change the brakes or the oil. I'm talking about really basic, primitive kinds of things. I even asked a person who I ran into on a commuter train, I said, so why are you driving those trucks around if they don't have the proper brakes or oil? He said, I have to, that's my job. I said, well, I mean, this is very odd that you're not being able to do basic safety issues. Again, he said, there is no budget. And these are large utilities, which the priority is a kind of hard to figure out. And then finally, we were talking about AMI a lot. So my power went out two days, I mean, twice in one day. So I went out and I discovered there were four men near a manhole cover working on the cable. And I had a chat with them and they said, um, oh, it's this issue, that issue. I said, well, you have AMI, you should be able to pinpoint where the power went out immediately. One of them said yes, the other one said no. And I looked at the third one, I said, I'm very confused. Which one is it? He said, it's a bit of both. Mm. So as a consumer, I was left bewildered and stunned that AMI was supposed to make this quick detection and quick resolution. So then I reached out to three dozen other utilities around the country. I put this case study in front of them. All of them said, yes, we have the same issue. There's a lot of systems that have to change. It is not AMI alone that will fix it. So what I'm talking about is really very basic stuff. Unless we do that, uh, all of the bigger dreams we have are sort of secondary. Yeah, I uh, spot on. And again, I, I keep thinking of how it, it's as simple as next time you're driving in the car, folks, and you're driving on whatever road you're in, look at the trees that are hanging over power lines. Look at the communities that don't have power lines. Now, you know, there's a cost to do that, but you know, you can go read about reports on when bad things happen, natural disasters, what could have been done and probably was recommended, but hey, you know, there's always opportunity to improve. Okay, we're in quick fire mode now. This is the parting shot and you each get 30 seconds. And I want you to leave something with the audience that, you know, the theme of today was, was private LTE, whether it was network grid of the future, what we can do better as a society and as humanity in a world right now that needs that hope. Um, what What is it you want to leave with the audience? So we're going to start up in the top left here with, at least on my screen, Brother Scott, parting shot. So when I just think I was writing down a bunch of the, the common themes throughout the day, right? We have, we have an industry with evolving needs secure, reliable, resilient, customizable, controllable um, network connectivity. So to me, I think about private LTE, especially with low band spectrum, 900 megahertz, the coverage uh, uh, and capacity that that provides. To me, that's foundational for this integration of the capabilities we have to, to go solve different problems. Well said. Andy? You know, we're at this uh, great moment in history where you've got the consumer uh, that's connecting with the utility and it, it's not just at the meter point anymore right you've got all these devices on both sides communication has never been more important than it is right now uh, for both parties so I, I what I'm excited about is as these things are unfolding utilities have a great chance to be in the middle of this uh, to kind of take the reins so to speak and and help further this along um, you know, through using communication technology. Well said, Ahmed. Uh, I, I, I totally support what I just heard. And I'm going to say we need prices to get down to devices. So not mm. just to the, but so I have an air conditioner, I have a refrigerator, I have an electric car, et cetera, et cetera. When the prices go up, I will prioritize my preferences. I'll say the price is high, begin eliminating these uses. And but this one is very important. Don't touch it at all. So I prioritize my preferences, maybe on my smartphone. When the price signal comes in, it goes through the devices. It automatically cascades up or down. So that's the, the goal I have, the vision, prices to devices. And it will require a lot of networking and communication. I love it. That's a great tweet, too, by the way. Rick, parting shot. I, I think it all starts with the utilities strategic plan. And then it evolves next to the grid modernization plan. 
And then from there, you have an understanding of what the overall needs are gonna be for communications. And then you kind of have what I'm calling it the third grid. You have a transmission grid, a distribution grid, and a communications grid. And that communications grid has now become, I think, is equally as important as the distribution and transmission grids. Without it, you're going to have reliability issues and resiliency issues. And we're starting to see that around the country. So that, that third grid, the communications grid, is critical for our futures. Well, I can't top any of it. I like to kind of break it down to what, what I heard. And first of all, thank you to you four awesome individuals. Uh, shout out to Mar Torres and Anthony behind the scenes and Danielle for pulling this together. We're going to do this again. We'd like to bring this collaboration together. I think this is where it starts. You never know who's watching, who heard something and said, you know, that's true. You could be a late adopter. You could be an early adopter with private LTE or the grid of the future. But folks, it's it's on us all. I think we agree that we we owe it to ourselves as a society and next generation. I, I have to quote Paula Gold Williams, the CEO of CPS, who said that, that her one of her uh, CPS Energy, one of her missions in life or a mission is to teach the next generation and the workforce of the future about where we are today and what they have the opportunity to do to to uh, you know improve the world. So uh, tech humanity culture, the smart connected communities and city, cities that we strive for, it takes a lot of what these folks talked about today, ping power pipe spectrum engineering and uh, you four are brilliant, thank you and I had a blast so I hope you did too. Thank you.